Welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. I'm Connie Lester, the editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The quarterly podcasts will be conducted by Robert Casanello, a member of the editorial board, and each will consist of an interview with a quarterly author. Before we begin the conversation, I would like to tell you some of the history of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Quarterly is the scholarly, peer-reviewed journal of the Florida Historical Society and is published four times annually. Membership in the Florida Historical Society includes a subscription to the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Society, which is housed in a historic WPA post office in Coco, was founded in 1856 and is the oldest such society in the state and the only statewide historical organization. The society began publishing a journal in 1908, but only published two volumes before suspending publication. In 1925, the Florida Historical Society resumed publication, which continues today. For most of its history, the Florida Historical Quarterly was housed at the University of Florida. In 1995, the quarterly moved to the University of Central Florida, where it remains today. The Florida Historical Quarterly is available online through JSTOR and through Palm. The Florida Historical Quarterly documents and interprets Florida's rich and diverse history, which includes the oldest European settlement in North America and the newest efforts by the United States to explore beyond the planet. Enjoy the podcast and the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is a peer-reviewed scholarly journal and publishes four times a year. The issue that we'll be discussing today is volume 87, number 4, which was published in spring 2009. Each issue contains four articles, book reviews, information about events that pertain to Florida history, and in the fourth issue of each year, the newest publications in Florida history and a cumulative index are published. Okay, and in this issue here, you have a publication of the Prescott Memorial Lecture. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? At the 2008 annual meeting, the theme of the meeting was Florida and the global environment. The Jillian Prescott Lecture was presented by Dr. Duane E. DeFries, who is a biologist, and the subject was the global environment and global warming and its effect on Florida. What are some of the other articles about in this issue? We have an article by Dorothy Mays, who is a librarian at Rollins College, and her article is on Gatorland and discusses the survival of Gatorland in the competitive environment of tourist attractions in Central Florida. Another article we have is by Geraldine Poyo, who is a retired professor of history in Texas, and he's writing about the baseball career of Francisco A. Poyo, who was his great-grandfather, and who played baseball in Key West and Havana in 1885 to 1910. Okay, and in this podcast, we're going to have an interview with author Jack Davis. Can you tell us a little bit about his article? Jack Davis's article is about uh, John D. McDonnell, who probably many of our listeners remember and read his uh, novels in the 1970s and 80s and into the 90s. His article is Sharp Prose for Green, and it's about John MacDonald's first uh, ecological no novel. As many of you know, John D. MacDonald uh, wrote mysteries, but he always included uh, material about the changing environment in Florida. Greetings. This is Robert Casanello, and I'd like to introduce you to Jack Davis. He's an associate professor of history at the University of Florida and he recently published a book titled An Everglades Providence, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the American Environmental Century. In this book, it is a dual biography of both Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the Everglades throughout the entire 20th century. In this article for the quarterly, he chose to examine the literary career and the activism of another Florida writer 
interested in environmental causes. And that is John McDonald, who is more of a popular fiction writer than, say, someone like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. There are four things which I asked Dr. Davis about concerning his article. One was, of course, who John McDonald was. Secondly, was this term that John McDonald really popularized known as uglification. I was also interested in how to place John McDonald within the context of other 20th century environmental and literary activists. Finally, I wondered what was the long-term impact of John McDonald, his ideas and activism, through Florida in the last 20 or 30 years. Following this will be Dr. Davis's explanation of all these issues. I do hope you enjoy it. John D. McDonald was a Northeasterner by, by birth and rearing, uh, who eventually found his way to Florida in the late 1940s, and uh, initially settling in Clearwater, and then eventually within a couple of years in, in Sarasota. And he lived there from the early 1950s till his, his death. And McDonald is, is known uh, worldwide as, as a, uh, a writer of fiction books and the hard-boiled fiction type, and most particularly for his Travis McGee series. And virtually all of his, most of his uh, fiction uh, was set in Florida. Uh, his Travis McGee series, I've forgotten how many books, I think there are about a dozen, ten or a dozen in the Travis McGee series. Uh, Travis McGee was his, his protagonist in that series, and uh, those are all set in, in, in Florida as well. And what's interesting about John D. McDonald, at least what I find interesting about him, is he, he had this, much like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, uh, and, 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 of course, Carl Hyacin uh, today, uh, he had this, you know, his writing, his books, uh, reflect this, his uh, personal environmental consciousness. Uh, he was also very active in uh, the local community in Sarasota, uh, trying, joining organizations, writing letters, editorials, supporting uh, the, the control of, of growth, uh, supporting growth management, supporting uh, protection of uh, Sarasota Bay and various uh, islands or keys in, in, in the area, and, uh, you know, the, the natural landscape generally. And uh, this is somebody who lived in Florida during a period in the post-war years, again, from the 50s to the 70s, in which Florida underwent uh, unprecedented uh, population growth and, uh, and development. And so he was eyewitness to these uh, events in, in Florida, and they, and they very much disturbed him. They disgusted him, uh, as, as a matter of fact. Uglification is a uh, John D. McDonald term. He used it in the um, dedication of his 1962 book, Flash of Green, which is considered the, the first ecological novel. And uh, another one of his books is set in Florida. And in that particular book, is the, the plot revolves around this in, a group of environmentalists who have organized to try to stop uh, the continued destruction of the bay and the and to try to stop a developer from filling the bay. Fill projects were very common in Florida in the 1950s and on into the 1960s. And, and he saw this as uglifying, uh, you know, the, the natural Florida landscape. And so he dedicated that book to those who opposed the uglification of, of America. And there was no place, to McDonald, there was no place more representative of that uglification than, than beautiful Florida that was turning increasingly ugly uh, with uh, condominium towers lining the beaches, with uh, roadways spiraling across the, uh, the landscape, uh, with the disappearance of wetlands and scrubland and hardwood hammocks, and, uh, and really the, the disappearance of some of the, of the, the most beautiful uh, vistas in Florida. Certainly, as the, as the 1950s, the, the prevailing attitude about unmanaged growth in Florida was one of really, I'm a reaction, I should say, to unmanaged growth in Florida was really prevailing reaction was really uh, one of indifference. 
there were those people like John D. McDonald and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Philip Wiley, and another writer who lived in uh, South Florida, and quite a few others actually uh, who were non-writers, but uh, but who were uh, very much disturbed by unmanaged growth. And and there were these groups that uh, emerged in the 1950s, local groups, grassroots organizations that were organized for specific reasons to challenge, say, a fill project in Boca Ciega Bay or Sarasota Bay or uh, a project to build an oil refinery in uh, Biscayne Bay. The, there were, so there were local groups like those that, that did organize mm -hmm. of citizens uh, to try to stop uh, those kind of insults on the natural environment. And this is before, and this is what I find interesting about, so interesting about Florida and John D. McDonald, and particularly his book, A Flash of Green, is that a lot of people argue that the modern environmental movement, which is really a, a movement of these local issue-specific groups that, that depend on ecological science to defend their position, a lot of people argue that the publication, 1962 publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, is what really spurred or kicked off the the modern environmental movement. It's ongoing in, in Florida in the 1950s. It's already there. Uh, and John D. McDonald is involved in it personally in Sarasota. He writes about it in his book, A Flash of Green, a fiction, you know, a novel that is was actually based upon real-life experiences in Sarasota and in, in St. Petersburg. And um, and they use ecological science, this modern science, which is only really in the 1950s being accepted within the American Academy as a legitimate field of study. And they in these local groups in Florida before Rachel Carson turned to ecological science to try to do, defend their position. And in some cases they're successful, in some cases they're not. So the, this the so-called modern movement is fully in gear in Florida before Rachel Carson. And I think that McDonald's message, uh, his message, along with many other activists in, in Sarasota, um, had, in, in fact, a significant impact, locally at least. Sarasota is, or the Sarasota, Sarasota County, Sarasota, uh, are probably one of the most, one, one of the place, areas in Florida that's most progressive when it comes to protecting uh, the waterfront, uh, the bay, the marine life, uh, and the environment generally, and experimenting uh, with new ways of, of conservation, such as gray water, and or capturing rainwater, and controlling growth. But beyond that, you know, I think unfortunately, McDonald's message, uh, the impact of his message, has been uh, been limited. I, I, you know, I think. As a historian, uh, and as we historians know, uh, Floridians tend to have a very short historical memory, and they constantly stay in trouble. They constantly get back into the trouble they had experienced before. Hurricanes come in, and they, they wipe out an area, uh, and people think, well, that'll control population growth. Uh, we won't rebuild there, or people will stop moving to Florida in these great floods. Uh, but they quickly forget about those hurricanes, um, and they go back to business as usual and populate those areas. Um, oh, well, there's a real estate bust. There was one in the 20s, obviously, one in the 70s. I remember growing up in Florida, that one. I mean, these unfinished apartment buildings and condominiums were skeletons all over the place, and people thought, well, this will finally control growth. And, and, of course, it didn't. And, uh, and I don't think that the economic crisis we're in now is going to have any more of impact on controlling growth than, than past economic crises have. Um, you know, the state legislature has is, is passed uh, laws recently that makes it easier for developer, developers to do their business as usual, uh, to fill wetlands, to... Uh, put in developments without having to pay for in infrastructure improvements. Uh, and so unfortunately, while I think McDonald certainly did inspire people locally in Sarasota and beyond, Carl Heisen, for instance, uh, who's one of those people that constantly complains in his writing about 
uh, Florida's growth or lack of uh, growth management. Uh, he was uh, clearly inspired by by, by John B. John D. McDonald, uh, as were others, and uh, uh, many activists as well. But unfortunately, not enough people have, have felt his, his influence. Thank you for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly Podcast. I hope you enjoyed our production.